from uh, Watsonville. Uh, she's lived in San Jose since 1982. Uh, Pam graduated uh, with a degree in architecture from UC Berkeley. She began working in the uh, San Francisco in the art with the uh, architectural firm, and you know she's moved to different uh, architectural firms throughout the Bay Area. Uh, Pam has worked in some uh, diverse projects. She so she worked on a book, uh, John Paul's visit to San Francisco. This was a um, that was a was non traditional architecture. Um, she's worked at uh, Beard Papas, and then also. You know this building that we're in right now. So she, she uh, designed the uh, Japanese American Museum of San Jose. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't work at Beard Papa's. I designed the oh. apartment. <laughs> 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 slight little. No, <laughs> <laughs> so so uh, yeah, Pam is actively engaged in the. Uh, San Jose Japantown community, and if you, you know, are in the area, I'm sure that you've seen her before. Uh, she serves on quite a few things here. So she's on the board of Japantown Community Congress of San Jose. Where she's the co-president. Um, and the Midori Kai, which is the uh, professional women's organization in the Bay Area. So Pam is a director, and she's also the grant chairperson. Um, Pam is a member of the West Valley JACL. Um, she's also co-chairperson of the Northern California, Western Nevada, Pacific District, U.S.-Japan Relations Committee. <laughs> um, and she's on uh, the National um, JACL, U.S.-Japan Education Committee. So I think that's going to say this. Every time I introduce people, it's like, Wow, these guys, you know, they just do so much. It's, it's great. Um, so Pam has been making uh, Kimik Homey dolls since 2005. In 2010, she received her teaching, or yeah, teaching certificate from the Taro Doll Craft Academy uh, in Tokyo. In uh, 2018, she received her Gago, which is a professional name. Pam is a member of the Northern California Shibu chapter, Mataro Yabikai. Yeah, I practice that a lot. But, uh, in her spare time, Pam enjoys learning and sharing Japanese traditions as, and customs as co owner of Nikkei traditions in San Jose, Japan. Now. Uh, Pam enjoys uh, making the Kinokomi dolls, cooking, traveling to Japan and spending time with her husband, Gordon. Uh, she has two rescue dogs, uh, Atsuhime and Chiyohime. <coughs> so um, on behalf of the Japanese American Museum in San Jose, we're really honored to have uh, Pam Yoshida. Thank you, Chris, for that introduction. And Chris Hioki is the Public Programs Chairperson for JAMS. And thank you all for attending this afternoon's program. So thank you again to JAMS for this wonderful opportunity to talk about Hinamatsu. <coughs> um, last year I was approached by JAMS to create a public program about Hinamatsu. And I want to say that I'm by no means an expert on Hinamatsu dolls. But as a child and throughout my life, I was always fascinated by these beautiful dolls and saw my first set at a Watsonville Buddhist Temple um, cultural exhibit called Hanamatsuri. And it was so beautiful and it was so magical. And after seeing my first set, I really wanted a set, but they're so big and they're so expensive. And I know it never got over wanting a set. So several years later, um, as Chris mentioned, I started taking Kumikomi doll, less, um, doll crafting lessons at the West Valley JCL. And in 2008, I made this, um, this Hina set, and you'll see this downstairs. So this journey of uh, uh, learning about Hina Matsuri dolls and Kimekomi dolls um, led me on this path of exploring and learning about Japanese culture through dolls. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about the evolution of Hina Matsuri dolls, a little bit about Japanese history. Um, we'll talk about World War II and Hina Matsuri. We'll talk about food and colors 
and how Hina Matsuri is celebrated today. So how did this all start here at JAMS? In 2012, JAMS um, started a tradition of having a Hina Matsuri festival, and it included a doll exhibit that was coordinated by Mei Matsuzaki and started with a weekend exhibit that included crafts and a doll exhibit. This year, the children's crafts took place last weekend on Sunday, so thank you for everybody who participated in that. Last year in 2019, JAMS extended the Hina Matsuri exhibit to two weeks, and this was very timely because JAMS acquired three of their very own uh, Hina Kazari at the end of 2018. So the acquisition of these three sets made it possible to create a separate exhibit for just these exhibits. And I felt it was important to let those uh, <coughs> Hina exhibits be in a separate area and to let the museum displays, which tell the important history of the Japanese Americans, um, rather than mix the dolls in with the exhibit. So this year in 2020, JAMS expanded this exhibit to be a separate exhibit in the rotating exhibit room. So now we have our own room, so that's really exciting. So all three of the sets that JAMS owns are very different, and I had the pleasure of being called on to inventory and check in those sets. And so these are the sets. And the first one we call the Pepper Set, and it's a 1940s traditional set that a young bride, her name was uh, Yoshiko Pepper, brought with her to America. The Nanbara Set is a handmade set by a lady who was born in Nebraska in 1916. And she studied Kimekomi doll making in San Fernando at a senior center and completed the set in 1960 for her granddaughter. And this family was actually downstairs earlier this morning looking at the set. The Yoshihara set is a vintage set from 1960s. Oh, <laughs> 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 I'm sorry, wrong button. That was awesome. <laughs> This is the Yoshihara set, and it's a vintage set from the 1960s from Santa Maria with a replica of a palace scene. And these three sets, along with the Kei Kawahara set, creates the base of the Jams Hinamatsuri exhibit, which is downstairs. And we have several other sets on loan from, uh, let's see, the Council General of San Francisco, which I mentioned earlier, and the Kei Kawahara set. And we are very excited to have the Council General set uh, join our collection this year. We also have two very special sets on loan for this exhibit. One's a set that now belongs to Gail Bush that was crocheted by her grandmother in the Amachi, Colorado concentration camp. And this is a really amazing set. So, you know, what after this, if you haven't seen it before, be sure you uh, take a look at this set. Um, another set that predates these sets were taken to the Gila River concentration camp by a woman with four daughters. This woman was Joyce Iwasaki's grandmother, and she chose to bring her Hina set. So of all the things that you could take to the camps, you know, think about what would you take, and Joyce's grandmother took her Hina sets with her. So we'll talk about these sets with Gail and Joyce in more detail a little bit later. So before we begin, throughout this talk, I will refer to... Oh, sorry. <laughs> I know I'm kicking the wrong button. Okay. Okay, my paper is on that button. Okay. So we, before we begin, throughout the talk, um, I'm going to talk to objects with Japanese names. And the two that I'm going to talk about are Hina Ningyo, which is the Girls' Day dolls, and that's the Emperor and Empress dolls. So when I refer to Hina Ningyo, that's what I'll be talking about. And the other one is Hina Kazari. And when I say Hina Kazari, that is usually the full Girls' Day set, which includes the Emperor and Empress and the various accessories. So how important is Hina Matsuri in Japan? Well, Hina Matsuri is one of five seasonal festivals in Japan, and it's referred to as Go Seku. Go meaning five, Seku meaning seasonal festivals. And these are really easy to remember. A lot of times people you know, can't remember when is Girls' Day, but you know, this, little, this little description will tell you about what the five seasonal holidays are and an easy way to remember them. So, Oshogatsu, New Year's, January 1st, first month, first day. And so March 3rd, again, third month, 
Hinamatsuri, it's Girls' Day, Momo no Seku, and it's the start of spring. May 5th is Tango no Seku, Boys' Day, and again, a little bit of confusion here because people are like, well, May 5th, is that Boys' Day or Kodomo no Hi? Um, it was traditionally Boys' Day, but uh, in 1948, after World War II, it became known as Kodomo no Hi, or Children's Day. So it's a day that's celebrated you know, for all children, boys and girls. July 7th is the Tanabata Festival. It's seventh month, seventh day. And September 9th is Chrysanthemum Day. So Girls' Day, going back to Girls' Day again, Hinamatsuri, was traditionally known as the Peach Festival as peaches typically began to flower around that time. But um, that's no longer true after um, the dates for these festivals all started out as the, uh, under the Chinese Lunar Festival. But um, over time, they switched over to the Gregorian dates. So now they're fixed dates. And um, you know, Girls' Day is still considered um, you know, the start of spring, peach day, even though it's shifted a little bit. So the importance of dolls in ancient cultures, um, we can talk about dolls a little bit. And the oldest known doll was recently discovered in Siberia, um, and it's 4,500 years old. It's a child's doll that's the size of your thumb, and it was buried with a small child. And this tells us that someone buried a doll with a child who passed away perhaps as a companion to comfort this child. And it tells us that dolls have been an important part of our human lives for thousands of years across many cultures. So I'm kind of mentioning this just, just to kind of um, get you to think that yes, dolls are, are very important and they mean a lot more than uh, things to play with. Dolls have always been known to possess the soul <laughs> and they take on attributes of the owner. The American girl, you know, even looks like it. You can buy clothes for the American girl, uh, for the American doll, and you can wear the same outfit too. So these two pictures kind of illustrate again the power of dolls. One's a positive example. You know, there's this little girl taking care of her doll. There's a friend. She cares very much about this doll. And then we have another example that's not so positive, <laughs> not quite as positive as a doll experience, but. Again, these images illustrate that people believe that dolls can possess the soul. And this belief was so strong that there's a Shinto shrine called Awashima Jinga in eastern Wakayama that helps people dispose of these dolls. And throughout the years, people bring dolls to the shrine, mainly Hina Ningyos. There are a lot of Japanese superstitions about dolls, and people in Japan seem to think that they're a little mysterious or scary, and they believe that they have souls or the power to influence human lives. And this might originate from the Shinto belief, in time, inanimate objects can possess the souls of people. And there's a number of shrines and festivals where people can dispose of their old dolls and toys, and because they believe if they throw them away that these dolls and souls are gonna come back and haunt you. So if you you know, if you look at this picture, all these little things in the, in the shrine are all little dolls, all these little bumpy things that you see. Okay, so here's a close-up of all the dolls behind the railing. And in this picture, you see all of these Hina dolls that people have brought to this shrine. So every year on March 3rd, Awashima Jinga is home to a doll festival called Nagashibina, in which boatloads of Hina Ningyo are launched into the ocean and as the boats are rocked by the waves, the dolls fall overboard and they sink into the ocean. And so it's believed that the dolls will take away sickness and bad luck from their owners. And the ritual has become very popular. Reflecting back again on the power of dolls, we can see why the Hina Ningyos are a reflection of a tradition of transforming somebody's mixed fortunes to a doll. While Hina Matsuri is a festival mainly intended for young girls, the origins have more to do with the purification of the emperor and the nation, as well as all members of the ruling class, more so than children, okay, because it's associated with children now. But originally, it started out as a festival to, um, you know, for the purification of the emperor. And it was only during the Edo period that there was a shift in the emphasis towards children. The origins of the Japanese Hina Matsuri was a purification ceremony called Joshi no Setsu. It's a seasonal festival that took place in ancient China around the year 300 AD. 
and Joshi refers to the day of the serpent in early March when the seasons are starting to change. And people believe when the seasons change, that's when misfortune can happen. <coughs> and so around this time, customs were practiced around water and these impurities. And people thought it was easier for devils to come inside of houses or their bodies when the seasons change. So they used to purify, purify themselves at the water side. During this long history of Joshi no Setsu in China, the custom was brought to Japan from China by Japanese envoys during the Tang Dynasty, and it became linked to Shinto purification rituals. And so these are scenes, um, the first two slides are at Shimogamo Shrine in Kyoto, and they do this every year um, during Hinamatsuri or Girls' Day, where, and we have a video downstairs that kind of shows um, you know, the, the practice of what they're doing. Um, the Heian period of Japan is very significant to today's, to, today, to today's talk because the traditions of the Nagashibina are first documented during the Heian period in the tales of Genji. The, the Heian period in Japan was from 749 to 1185 and it lasted nearly 400 years and it became known as the Golden Age of Japan. The Heian period began when the Emperor Kamu moved his capital from Nara to Heian Kyo, to what, and Heian Kyo is now known as current day Kyoto. So, this was the Heian period, was a time of peace and prosperity when Buddhism, Taoism, and Chinese culture were important in the development of art and architecture to create a culture that was uniquely Japan. The Heian period was a time of sophisticated elegance, and it's a time characterized by the Juni Hitoe. Um, or 12 layers of kimono, and it was characterized by beautiful court life. It was a time of leisure, and in Japanese art, it's characterized by nobles and royalty who spent their time being beautiful and playing games to pass the time of day. They did things like they painted elaborate images on clam shells, and this is known as kai awase, and they played matching games with the shells. So it's kind of like our card games where you match up cards, but they did this with these beautiful images and pictures. They wrote a poetry, and they played games, and they held festivals like the Gokusui no En, where the noble, nobility would dress in elaborate clothing, and they would write poetry on paper and float it down the river for others to read. So this is kind of a reenactment in Japan where they reenact that festival, and, and people are writing poetry, and they put it on these little things that float down the rivers, and people further down will you know, pick up the poetry, read it. They also float sake on these little, little floating things, too. But this type of lifestyle in the Heian period was, was really um, for only about 10% of the population. And the rest were people who supported the economy, such as farmers or peasants. And I mentioned earlier that something that happened during the Heian period was the writing of the Tales of Genji. So the Tales of Genji was written during the 10th century, and it's believed to be the very first novel written in the world. Now, I didn't know that. I always thought you know, it was like Chaucer and Canterbury Tales and all of those. But the Tales of Genji was the first novel written in, in, the, in the world. And it's a, it's a book written by Murasaki Shikibu, who is a member of the royal court, about her life and the life of the nobility. And so if you write and document things, one would do this, you know, one would write about your own life, your own family, you know, similar to writing a diary. The, the, the Tales of Genji focuses on Hikaru Genji, and when, in one pa passage of the book, Genji had been exiled to the shores of Suma Bay. And this passage in the book is one of the first um, writings where we read about the Nagashibina ceremony. But um, Lady Murasaki writes that the third month, which was March, was now beginning. And someone who is supposed to be well up in these matters reminded Genji that one in his circumstances would do well to perform the ceremony of purification on the coming festival day. Part of the ritual consisted in the loading of a little boat with a number of doll-like figures and letting it float out to sea. And Genji, although isolated from his family, still felt compelled to participate in the century-old ritual. So Genji participates in this ritual and hopes that he can transfer his misfortune 
to the dolls and watches it float away, similar to what we saw at the shrine, um, at the uh, shrine where you bring your dolls. The evolution of the Hina dolls changed from Nagashi Bina, which is um, on that side, um, to your left, and changed from the purification ritual of rubbing the doll, transferring misfortunes, and sending, and sending it off to sea, to something that was a little bit more permanent. And so now we're starting to see a change from the Nagashi Bina to what's known as the Amagatsu doll. And this was a cloth doll, um, you know, very similar in form, or um, it's very similar form to the Nagashi Bina, but now it's three-dimensional and it's made out of cloth. And this was due to a time, you know, the time of Japan, which was becoming more economical and, um, you know, it was growing, uh, the urban environment was growing a little bit more. These figures were believed to serve as a temporary place for the gods to bless and purify the home, and sometimes they had little offerings in front of them. The, uh, um, ama the Amagatsu dolls soon became more sophisticated and evolved into the standing Tachibina doll forms. So from that form, now we see how <coughs> this has changed to the standing Tachibina dolls, and we have some Tachibina tachi dolls in our exhibit downstairs. The standing dolls represent a male figure, the obina with his arms outstretched. And the female figure is called the maybina, and she's tubular with long braided hair. And these standing dolls eventually evolved to two-seated imperial dolls on, on your right. Then they transferred, then they transitioned to what we know as the traditional full hina kazari set. The traditional hina set was developed in the final era of the traditional Japanese government in the ruling period of the Tokugawa shoguns, and this was during the Edo period from 1603 to 1868. And again, you know, it was the end of the uh, traditional Japanese rule of the emperor, and now we're transitioning over to rule by the shoguns. Um, this was a time of artistry, and when wood, woodblock prints developed, kabuki, but most importantly, it was the rise of the merchant class. And that's really important to remember because it was really a rise of the merchant class that takes us into the next major development of the Hina dolls. Um, in 1867, Hina Matsuri actually became legally a holiday in Japan. During the Edo period, the shogun made it a custom to make a present of a doll set to all the baby girls newly born in the inner palace. And later members of the shogun uh, presented a set of Hina dolls to Chiyohime, who is later, uh, who was Iemitsu, um, the shogun's eldest daughter, on March 1st, uh, 1684, to commemor commemorate her seventh birthday. The earliest recording of displaying the dolls as part of the Peach Festival um, was in 1625, and it was by uh, the emperor's daughter, and she was the one who, uh, she later became an empress and legally made Hinamatsuri a festival. Soon, doll makers began making elaborate dolls for the festival, some growing as tall as three feet high, and laws were passed down restricting their size, and over time, the Hinakazari grew from the emperor and empress, so we've seen how they've grown from the little paper floating things to um, standing dolls to seated dolls, and you know, again, <coughs> just two dolls, but now we're starting to see the full Hinakazari with the emperor and empress. Now there's uh, ladies in waiting, five court musicians, two advisors, three attendants, food, flowers, trees, and indoor furniture and outdoor furniture, everything that a royal couple would need. And, and that is, again, part of the Edo period, the merchant class, because it's part of human nature to want something bigger and grander, and this led to the Hinakazari as we know it today. So as dolls became more expensive, tiers were added to the Hinadon so that the expensive dolls could be placed out of reach of young children. The main aspect of the Hinamatsuri festival is the display of the Hina dolls, and the essential part of the display is a seated male and female doll, the Obina and Nebina, literally again, the male doll and female doll, 
which represents a Heian wedding described as the emperor and empress of Japan, of Japan, usually on a red cloth. These may be as simple as pictures or folded <coughs> paper or intricately carved three-dimensional dolls, and you'll see a wonderful variety of dolls in the jams exhibit today. All of the jams dolls um, on exhibit are handmade with the exception of a few that are mass produced. Families normally ensure that girls have a set of, of the two main dolls before their first hinamatsuri. The dolls are usually fairly expensive for a five-tier set depending on quality and often would be handed down from older generations as heirlooms. The Hinakazari spends most of the year in storage, and girls and their mothers began setting up the display a few days before March 3rd. Traditionally, the dolls are so supposed to be put away by the day after Hinamatsuri, the superstition being that leaving the dolls any longer will result in a late marriage for the daughter. But some, but some families may leave them up for the entire month of March. And I think, I think that was developed because uh, they wanted to encourage people to put the dolls away quickly to avoid the rainy season and humidity that's, uh, um, you know, that is typical of Japan. Historically, the dolls were used as toys, but in modern times, they're intended for display only. And the display of dolls usually discontinues when the girls reach around 10 years old. The first tier consists of the emperor who's holding a ritual baton and the empress with a fan in her hands. The empress is not wearing a mere kimono, but a series of kimono called the Juni Kikoe. And we saw that a little bit earlier. It's a 12 beard ceremonial kimono, and the royal family in Japan wears it during weddings and special ceremonies, even today. And so you may have seen um, images of this last year when a Naruhito um, became emperor in Japan. So there's uh, Emperor Naruhito and Masako, uh, the Empress Masako. Traditionally, the emperor was set up on the right from the viewer's perspective, but in a modern dis display, he's sitting on the left. The Hina dolls are usually put in front of a folding screen, and these folding screens are very common in Japan for any type of decoration that's seasonal. They're often used to display the zodiac of the current year on the screen, and most of the time, they're also uh, lamp, lamp stands, which are decorated with plum blossoms or cherry blossoms. Uh, representing the spring season. Artificial peach branches are put into two vases and set up between the emperor and empress. The next tier is for the three court ladies, San Nin Kanjo, who all hold sake equipment. And placed between them are stands with round table tops with seasonal sweets on top. And from left to right, you see the backed up sake bearer who is standing, a sake bearer who is sitting, and a long-handled sake bearer who is standing. The third tier has a total number of five musicians. It's called the Gonin Bayashi. And apart from the singer who has a fan, all of them hold a musical instrument from left to right. It's a drum, seated drum player with a taiko drum. Next is a standing player with a big drum. Next to him is another uh, standing drum player. The fourth person is holding a flute. And the last player is a singer who holds a sensu or a Japanese folding fan. The fourth tier displays two ministers who sometimes carry bows and arrows. And the minister of the right is on your left. OK, so it's that one. And uh, let's see, he, he is a younger younger um, minister. And the one on the left is called Sadaijin. He has a long white beard as he's the superior in the old Japanese court and thus the older one of the two ministers. Often there are two tables between the ministers as well as diamond-shaped stands with diamond-shaped rice cakes called hishimochi, on which, uh, which is a traditional dish for the Hinamatsuri. The next tier are the three male protectors of the emperor and empress and they are referred to as the whiny drinker, the quarrelsome drinker, and the merry drinker. And if you look at these dolls downstairs, especially the first set, which is from the Council General, look at their faces. They're very expressive, very, very, very interesting. Also very common are Japanese garden trees, which can be placed anywhere, not just on this tier. But there are two types of trees. One's a mandarin tree and a cherry tree. 
and the cherry tree is often substituted with the peach tree as the Hinamatsuri is the season of the peach blossoms. On the sixth tier, you'll find a variety of miniature items that can be found within the Imperial Palace, and common items include a small chest of drawers, another set of drawers, um, a long chest used for kimono storage, a small box used for storing clothes, uh, utensils for the tea ceremony, a sewing kit box, and two hibachis. And on the bottom tier are things that are used outside of the palace. And so you'll find things like in the middle, um, the jubako, which is a tiered lacquered food box used for osechi. And on one side is a carriage drawn by an ox, and the other one is another carriage that is carried by people. During the Meiji period, as Japan began to modernize, the emperor was restored to power. So we see a shift here from the shogun to now we're returning back to the emperor. And this is kind of important because now new holidays that focused on the emperor's bond with the nation were favored. And so Hinamatsuri was revived because the Hinamatsuri set, you know, uh, you know, re represents the emperor and, and the court. So by focusing on marriage and families, it represents Japanese hopes and values as the dolls were said to represent the emperor and empress. It also fostered death for the throne. With the Japanese now migrated throughout the world, Hinamatsuri also spread to other countries, although it remained confined to immigrant Japanese communities and their descendants. So it wasn't like, you know, when J Japanese migrated, the areas that they went to, you know, they brought, it, it wasn't like Christmas, right? It, so it kind of stayed within the Japanese community. So this year we have two sets on loan on display in the JAMS exhibit that dem oh, oh no! <laughs> there we go! I, sorry about that. So this year we have two sets on loan in the JAMS exhibit that demonstrates this migration of how the Japanese immigrants brought the Japanese culture outside of Japan. And to me, these two sets in particular show the strength of the Japanese during the World War II incarceration. And no matter what the circumstances, the well-being of their daughters was of the utmost importance. So imagine the feelings and decisions of the Japanese when they had to pack for the incarceration camps. You know, what will you need? What should you take? What's important? So many Japanese families burned and destroyed family heirlooms because it connected them to Japan, and Japan was the enemy. And so today, we're so fortunate that two sets in the JAMS exhibit survive, and they're being shared with us, and they have an incredible history. And these two sets are very special and emphasize how the Hina doll tr traditions were to families even in the turbulent times of World War II. So I'd like to turn this over to two ladies who loaned us their Hina sets to share with you. And these dolls were in the incarceration camps during World War II. So first we'll hear from Joyce Iwasaki, and then uh, Gail will um, join us after that. So Joyce, do you want to come up and talk about your Hina set? I'm going to take you on a journey of our Hina dolls, and it starts off with my grandfather, who, with his younger brother and his uh, father, immigrated from Wakayama. So they came first, and then I don't know where they landed or whatever, but uh, they settled in Winters, California. And then my grandmother uh, was a picture bride, and so he, she joined them in the winters. Um, they were farmers, and they worked very hard. Um, but my fa I'm so proud of my family, my, my grandparents, in that as hard as they worked and ha as tired as they were, um, they had four daughters, and they actually incorporated a lot of fine arts in their daughters. My mother took piano lessons, and my um, three aunties were into odori and shamisen and, and singing. So with their busy lives, they actually in, instilled some of the culture that, uh, that I'm proud that my, my mom and aunties got to, um, got to experience. So in winters is when um, 
the uh, incarceration happen. They had to pack up like like all the families. They had to pack up what they can carry. And I always heard that my grandmother was the one who took the Hina dolls with her. I never heard ever that my grandfather was like for this idea. So I'm kind of thinking if I were there, there was probably an argument about what they're going to be taking. And, and knowing my grandmother, um, you know, she had a mind of her own because she did have, they did have four daughters and they were all teenagers. So, um, so she packed the dolls up and, they, and she took them to camp. And uh, the teenagers, uh, they were, there were teenagers in the camps, but my mother got married um, in camp. She was about 20 and she got married. So when resettlement came, um, they resettled in Sanger, Sanger, California. And, um, and then, so the grandchildren, including me, were, we were all born um, after camp. My brother was actually born in camp, but all of the other cousins, we were born after camp. And um, it was such a wonderful, this is the story I hear, it was such a wonderful thing that um, my mom had, um, her second child was a girl, and that girl was me. So, <laughs> so um, my grandmother saved the dolls until I was born, and then she gave it to my mother to give to me. And I am so lucky that I have it because uh, they are they now belong to my children. And so um, my girls are here, um, Adele, Adele, and Alexis, and the dolls are theirs. As my cousins, we all took out our Hina dolls, and as my cousins took out their set, Theirs were elaborate. They, theirs were the five tier, you know, it was just absolutely gorgeous. But my grandmother and my mother always emphasized that really I had the best set. <laughs> and, and now I can appreciate that is absolutely true. So that's, um, that's the journey of the dolls. And then I have a grandson. And uh, should he grow up and have a daughter, that I'll say, well, be his or hers or his <laughs> child's, right? And if not, I, I, we do have other, other relatives. Actually, all of the, uh, it, in his generation, they're all boys. But somebody's going to have to have a girl. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I think. And that's the journey of our, uh, our birds. So. Example of what people did in the camps. And Gail talked about your set before, and so can you share a little bit of the story about the sets or your family? Hello, everybody. <laughs> uh, well, my grandparents came from Japan and they settled in Turlock, California, which is in the Central Valley. And they were sent to Merced County Fairgrounds and eventually to Amachi, Colorado. That's where my grandmother crocheted all the dolls. And my grandfather carved every wood piece in there, including the boxes that we store them in. But I didn't get a chance to ask them many questions because when I grew up, I didn't have this doll set. I had a regular manufactured one that we put up every year. And then after my daughter was born, I think my mom kind of just remembered that she had this. So I've only had this for about 25 years. And at the time, it was amazing when she brought it out because I couldn't believe she did all that. It's so tiny, but um, we would just display it at home every once in a while. But I never thought to ask her any questions because I never thought it would be displayed anywhere but at home. And when I displayed it here, when I started volunteering, everybody started asking me questions. And my grandmother was already gone, and my auntie and my mom um, weren't around, they worked in Boulder, Colorado while they were in camp. And they also didn't even come back with them on the same train. So I asked my auntie a couple of months ago, you know, how they got it back. And she said they just must have brought it on the train because they came on se separate chains. So, um, but we love them and I have a daughter, so she's gonna get it. And it's just amazing how, how tiny all the detail is and uh, grandpa has a whole bunch of other carvings that we have 
and my grandmother also crocheted a lot of big tablecloths and dresses and all kinds of things that we still have. So I'm glad we get to share with you because otherwise it would just be at home and nobody would get to see it. <laughs> so we love bringing it here every year and I'm glad this year we got to spend a whole week here. And it's not bad luck, even though my daughter's still not married. It's okay. <laughs> 28 on Monday, but it's okay. <laughs> And um, when you look at um, Gail's set, and it's kind of knitting <laughs> against the wall in the set, take a look at those boxes. Because last year, when Gail was packing up the boxes, and she mentioned, oh, yeah, Grandpa made these boxes, too. And I looked inside, and you can see a year, a date stamped, and it's 1940, probably 1942. So that's pretty amazing in itself. But, um, you know, um, I know each of these two sets that we just saw speaks of the hopes of the families of the camps who did not know what the future was for them or for their families, and yet they still have this deep sense of Japanese culture and tradition and hope for their daughters to have a happy and good life despite, despite what they were going through. So, be, so please be sure to visit those two sets and try to imagine the joy that these Hina dolls brought to the incarcerees in this time of darkness and uncertainty, and the amazing choices that these families had to make to bring these dolls to camp and to resettle with the dolls after World War II. And again, thank you, Joyce and Gail, for, for sharing those precious dolls with everyone. So I'm going to talk about colors and symbolism now with Hinamatsuri. And symbols, um, the symbolic colors associated with Hinamatsuri, and it's represented by these three colors and so whenever you see things in the Hinamatsuri motif you're usually going to see white, pink, and green. And the white represents the pure and cleansing snow and it represents the end of winter. Um, you know again since you know, Hinamatsuri is a seasonal festival so it's the end of winter and it also represents the purification and goes back to remember um, the origins of Hinamatsuri to the Nagashibina. It goes back to purification um, from the Nagashi Bina uh, ceremony. And the pinkish red color symbolizes peach blossoms, and it's a look back to the festival's Momonoseku tradition and the color that's used to chase away evil spirits. And again, you know, that might be from the tradition that goes back to China about, you know, firecrackers are red. And green representing springtime and health. Okay, foods associated with Hinamatsuri. And you know, in Japan, you know, uh, you know, I keep talking about you know, uh, seasonal holidays, and, and that's one of the really wonderful things I find out about Japan, is that it's a very seasonal uh, country, and you go there and you can only get certain things at certain times of year. And so um, Hinamatsuri, again, is associated with spring. And you know, Japan, you know, I always say Japan is a is a culture that eats with their eyes and is a country based on the beauty of the seasons. Uh, foods are seasonal and they're associated with being winter foods, fall foods, and so here are some spring foods with Hinamatsuri. So to celebrate spring, the sakura mochi is a seasonal treat and season, uh, springtime, the springtime mochi <coughs> is a bean paste filled rice cake with cherry leaves which are edible and we're so fortunate that Shueido Manju makes these in San Jose, Japan town with the leaves imported directly from Japan. Unfortunately, since it's seasonal, March 3rd was last week, um, you won't be able to find this at Shueido. Okay, so you're gonna have to wait a year to, to get these wonderful treats. We see the colors of Hinamatsuri in foods that are associated with the Hinamatsuri traditions, such as the tricolored Hishimochi, and again you see the, the three colors of uh, Hinamatsuri in the Hishimochi. These are diamond-shaped rice cakes with three colors represented by Hinamatsuri, and it's frequently seen in the Hinamatsuri doll exhibit, so you'll see those downstairs. And the rice cake's diamond shape is a traditional symbol of fertility. Hina arare is a sweet rice cake puffs in the colors associated with Hinamatsuri, and you can find them at the Japanese grocery store, um, like Nijia. Nijia was carrying these, but only at 
um, only during Hinamatsuri. And I will admit one fail. I was going to uh, purchase Hinamatsuri, uh, not Hinamatsuri, Hina Arare for today's uh, presentation. I went on March 4th to Marukai and Mitsuwa, and they didn't know what I was talking about. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and they said, oh yeah, well we're going to put it out March 7th. I'm like, no, it's for March 3rd. And I'm like, well, we don't have them anymore. Usually it'll be in front. So, you know, this is something that, um, you know, if you do want Hina Arare for Hina Matsuri, you need to go there before March 3rd. <laughs> um, another food associated with Hina Matsuri is clam soup. And ushio jiru, it's a soup with clams using salt and sake. And the reason clam shells are significant is that clam shells are symbolic of a united couple, with each side uniquely matching the other side. So if you think about clams, when you fold it in half, they match perfectly, but if you separate them and try to match them with another pair, um, you can't do that because they are unique to that, that one pair. And this symbolizes the hope that the daughters will find a good partner for marriage in the future. And shirashi is a special type of Japanese um, as a sushi rice featuring the colors associated with Hina Matsuri. Um, a few weeks ago, um, San Jose Buddhist Church um, BWA had a, ch a shirashi fundraiser. And you know, again, shirashi you know, associated with the springtime. So these are two examples of chidashi. This is kind of a cool, um, you know, I call it a chidashi cake because it's like in layers. And then the, the more traditional uh, chidashi, but again with the springtime colors. Shirozake or amezake is a sweet white sake made from fermented rice. And the idea behind Hinamatsuri is to pray for a healthy and happy life for one's daughter. So it only makes sense that these colors are also part of the special dishes for this festival. Okay, so how is Hinamatsuri celebrated today in Japan? <coughs> There's a lot of places uh, in Japan where they uh, do celebrate Hinamatsuri, and these are some examples of shrines, uh, retail displays, but you know, it's a, uh, they do some really fun installations with the Hina dolls in, in different tradition, uh, contemporary settings. But you know, again, just you can just see the variety of ways that you can display the uh, Hina Ningyo during Hina Matsuri. I just love how they take these the three little ladies in waiting and they cluster them to make them look like they're at a little tea party. And then you know, again, more places in Japan where they um, you know, display them in very non-traditional ways. And so again, in some references, there is a Nagashi Bina Museum in Totori, Japan. And if you um, know Yoko Kobashi, Yoko is from Totori in Japan. Yoko was, um, was a, a wonderful woman who lived with her husband in Japan up to a few years ago. But it was through um, Yoko that you'll see in our exhibit, there is a uh, actual Nagashi Bina from the Totori Museum. And that was through um, Yoko's connections that I was able to get a actual Nagashi Bina sold at the museum. There's a, there's a doll museum in Iwakuni in Saitama. And I mentioned earlier the Awashima Jinga in Eastern Wakayama where you can take your dolls and they will dispose of them for you. And Shimogamo Shrine in Kyoto, which is one of the oldest shrines in Kyoto. Okay, today locally in San Jose, Japan town. Okay. Um, Locally, um, Hinamatsuri is celebrated in San Jose, Japan town, again at Jams with the children's crafts and our exhibit, Shiwedo Manjuya uh, with the uh, Sakura Manju Kogura gift. This, this image that I'm constantly showing is from Koguras and um, Carolyn uh, dismantled it yesterday um, because it was after Hinamatsuri. Um, Nijia with her snacks and treats. Um, BK Traditions, we have books about uh, Hinamatsuri and <coughs> celebrations and um, uh, cultural uh, Japanese events. And also Hakone Gardens, I think about two weeks ago, they had a Hinamatsuri event. Um, celebrated locally in Southern California. I took this off of my Facebook page. 
And this is, um, if you are familiar with Reverend Hirota from Watsonville, this is his family. It's his wife, his daughter, and Ayo's two daughters. And uh, I took this off my page a few weeks ago, and um, I told Aya, uh, is it okay if I put this in the presentation? And she said, yes, I'm just so lucky that my mother you know, continues this tradition to share with my two daughters. So what I'm not showing is like a, a whole Kinamatsuri feast that Mrs. Hirota prepared for her two granddaughters and for Aya. And today in San Jose, you know, we have this, uh, the first picture is about 20 years ago. This is um, Nicole Harada with her little Kinamatsuri party with some of her friends. And then this was taken about two years ago with my Japanese uh, language group where we had um, our sensei um, had a little Hinamatsuri um, potluck party for us. So, so you see a lot of local people here um, celebrating with the, uh, with the uh, sweet uh, sake and um, sensei's chidashi. Actually the chidashi I showed you in the picture earlier was one that um, our sensei made for this. Uh, um, you know, I hope that this presentation showed you the evolution of Hinomatsuri from the Joshi no Setsu festival in China, 300 AD, and which transitioned to the Nagashi Bina, which was a purification <coughs> ceremony for the emperor, and developed into this unique display of an imperial um, Heian wedding scene. The importance of Hinamatsuri to uh, Japanese culture, you know, again, it's widely celebrated in Japan, and the variety of our dolls in our jams um, ex exhibit is evidence of how popular Hinamatsuri is in Japan. And you'll find that the Hina dolls like Hello Kitty, you'll find Tiny Cats, Precious Moments, Mickey and Minnie, along with our more traditional sets. And so I hope you've seen how this festival evolved, you know, through the years and through commercialism and marketing developed into a display of an imperial wedding designed to socialize young girls and prepare them for a married life. To have a <laughs> Hina display meant health and happiness for your daughter. To me, the spirit of Hina Matsuri is best shown to us in the World War II sets on display. And, it, and you gotta think, what were Joyce and Gra uh, Gail's grandmothers thinking? You know, what were they feeling? What were people feeling when they looked at these sets in the camp? And, you know, overall, it was to hope and pray for the well-being and health of their daughters. And that was the utmost importance to these families, no matter what the situation was. And so before closing, I've got a real treat for you today. Did you know there's a song related to Hina Matsuri? And Iris is going to pass out um, the words to the Hina Matsuri song. So Smiley Kai of Ukulele Source and Tina Urata, who are both with the Wesley Ukulele Band and Chisa Matsunaga have been practicing this Hina Matsuri song to play for you today. And it's not just play for you, it's to sing along with them. So I'm gonna turn it over to Tina, Smiley, and Chisa. Yeah, we, we really do need help with the singing. <laughs> See, no mic in front of me.
an easy song, and they learned and practiced just to share with you. So this isn't something that they play all the time. They, you know, <laughs> <laughs> you know what a man. <laughs> No, but they did the research, they wrote down the lyrics, they uh, composed it uh, you know, on ukulele, which you know, kind of sounds like koto. I was really totally amazed it sounds like koto. Um, so the song references some of the parts of the hinakazari, such as the, you know, in the song it talks about the bonbori lanterns, and, and those are the lanterns on the first tier of the hina set, and many other references to the hina matsuri festival. Um, so, um, you know, again, thank you for attending today's presentation about Hinamatsuri. And downstairs we have a great display. There's five videos showing different aspects of Hinamatsuri in Japan. There's one about the Nagashi Hina ceremony in Shimogamo Shrine. And it also shows um, unique ways of displaying Hina dolls in Japan. And there's also a video from a doll company in Japan called the Yoshitoku Doll Company. And it describes a certain uh, it describes the creation of each part of the doll set. And you might note that as you, if you do watch that video, the doll set from the Council General's office is made by the Yoshitoku Doll Company. Um, so again, I hope you enjoyed the history of Nike Ma uh, Hina Matsuri, which uh, evolved from the floating binas to uh, the single Amagatsu dolls, which later evolved to the Tachi Bina dolls. <laughs> and uh, the progression of that to the seated emperor and empress Hina Ningyo sets to the wonderful, amazing, elaborate Hina Kasari multi-tiered sets honoring the style of the Heian period of which you'll see downstairs. I yeah, hope you enjoy the exhibit downstairs. Okay. <laughs>